Welcome to the Wednesday Bible study. We're waiting on key. There he is. Okay, we're ready to go now. All right, so welcome in for uh, another Bible study today. If you're joining us for the first time, we are walking through uh, the Revelation. Today, if a gentleman in the room, y'all want to turn to it, or ladies and gentlemen watching, let's turn to the Revelation. We're going to go to chapter 4 today. We finished the seven letters to the church, uh, and now we will go into... um, uh, we'll, we'll take a shift on what John is about to experience next, and we'll talk about that a little bit today. A little bit of homework. If you are wondering what's going on here, we do this most every Wednesday. Uh, it, it's live on the Rick and Bubba YouTube channel at noon Central, 1 o'clock Eastern. Then it's archived uh, by our producer, uh, Mr. Chris Adler, and then it's available to you on our YouTube channel or the audio only on our podcast channel. If you want to go back and say, I need to catch up on this series, or I want to go back and and I want to listen to some of the old Bible studies you guys have done over the last uh, near decade, you can do that by going to themanchurch.com. Themanchurch.com, you'll see a media button there. Click that. It'll drop down, say you want to listen to this or you want to watch this. Pick what you want to do, and they're all lined up right there for you. Uh, And thank you for the feedback that we get. I'm welcome to help you. I'm standing by and and more than happy to help you. You're welcome to email me, rick at burgessministries.com, if you do have any questions. I also want to remind you we got a brand-new resource that just came out. Uh, This is a 31-day devotional. Uh, It's the first work that, uh, that I've ever been asked to write the commentary myself. Um, and uh, which usually means I've written commentary that I've learned from a, a lot of people who have been discipling me uh, ever since I was redeemed in 1996. So uh, all the things that I have learned uh, through Scripture and through their incredible teaching uh, can be found in, in this book called Transformed, Embracing the Death of Self and the Power of God, 31 of the most um, challenging verses in the Bible that deal with the truth that Jesus transforms those he redeems. And if we haven't been transformed, then we might want to take a look at the claim to be redeemed. So it's it's all there, 31 days. I uh, would love for you, men or women, uh, to take uh, this 31-day challenge. You can get this at themanchurch.com under the store, or you can get it at rickandbubba.com under the store too. So we got a lot to cover today. Uh, let's open up in a word of prayer, and let's jump right in. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity to unpack your holy word. Uh, Lord, today, please be with me as we, we shift into things that the, our finite minds can, can, we have difficulty wrapping our minds around this. So help us, Lord. We need the power of the Holy Spirit as we unpack your holy word. In your name we pray, amen. Uh, so at themanchurch.com, too, if you want to check any, um, you know, get into our men's discipleship strategy all of that can be found right there. If you want to find man churches near you, click on events. You can plug in through those services. If you would uh, just like to plug into the curriculum at your own church, we have those there. We have three. We have a fourth coming out uh, in April. So all that discipleship strategy and resources at themanchurch.com. So let's look at uh, at uh, Revelation chapter 4 today. So this um, we're going to make a shift here, and also we're going to pick up the tempo a little bit. Uh, you know, I'm going to slow down where we need to, but we're going to try to get through this entire chapter today. It's only 11 verses, but wow, what uh, what 11 verses they are. So the churches uh, we finished, those are seven letters to the churches. Uh, the church will not be mentioned again until the very end of the Revelation. So what we're going to see now are really visions of government, um, and, and we're going to take a shift now, and, and, and this big chunk of of the revelation on the journey we're on now, starting in four today, uh, once we get out of this throne room, you're going to see that from from going forward, it's now God showing John uh, really dealing with Israel and the nations, uh, not the church. Uh, God's going to judge the world uh, that crucified his son. Uh, And 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 these are the events that are going to usher in the end. We start that today. The first scene that we're going to unpack in today's lesson is going to be one of heaven where we get a vision of the throne of God. Now, this um, this is going to show us what the late Steve Farrar, and I'm sure others have said it, but I just remember him saying it all the time. I was so thankful. For, every time I would hear him say this, I would be at peace. He would say, don't ever think as we're ushering our way to the end that all this is out of control. It is completely under his control, and John's going to see that. 
uh, you're going to see that this throne is represented uh, as that God is is completely in control of what's going on. So throughout this entire period of judgment, you're going to notice that he doesn't move from that throne. Okay, but he, he's got to show it to John first. You'll, you'll, we'll walk through over the next few chapters three series of judgments. Uh, you're going to see the seals. We'll talk about that, S-E-A-L-S, the trumpets, the vials, all that's coming as the world becomes more and more wicked and godless uh, and, um, and lawlessness uh, will come to a head. If, if you want to also look at Jesus talking about this in other places in Scripture, uh, jot down Matthew 24 and jot down Mark 13. It's the same uh, a teaching that Jesus, but you have two different perspectives. One, Mark interviewing Peter about it, and then when you go to Matthew, it's Matthew talking about it as he took it down. And one of the things that, that, that Jesus mentions, and there's a lot, we don't have time for that to, all that today, but one of the things he mentions as we usher our way to the end, and no one knows the length of the time. Nobody knows, okay, so I'm, I'm not going to pretend to know. Jesus said when he was here with us on earth, he didn't even know. The angels don't know. The Father knows. So we just have to don't – there's no – if somebody tells you that, that the world is ending and Jesus is coming back Thursday week, he's not. That's not going to happen because no one knows. And if they tell you they know, they're a false teacher, okay? Because So don't listen to that. All these people are – they are not worthy of our time. Do not be drawn into these charlatans, okay? So anyway, and I love that when they miss one, they'll just go, oh, well, I missed that, and then they'll come up with another one. But anyway, so – but the bottom line is one of the things that Jesus says, and remember, this is the world. you, you got to get out of this mindset in this room, and if you're watching in America, I know some of you are other places, the world is much bigger than the United States of America, okay? you, you got to remember that. Sometimes we think this is the whole world. It's not. But what Jesus said is lawlessness will continue to surge. As, and he said, I don't know the day, the day, just like you don't know when a baby is going to be born, but one of the birth pains that Jesus tells us to look for is lawlessness. He said, he said that's going to increase as we get closer to my return. Uh, so take a note of that. Uh, but uh, it's going to come to a head uh, when, when he finally hands out his judgment. God is going to step in to make a full and final end to the problem of sin. That's where all this comes from. You know, we talk about this all the time on the, the day job that I have. You know, you can talk all day long about uh, thinking that you can find some way to stop all these mass evil killings, this just meaningless taking of human life, and you can go to the weapons and you can go to all this, but if you really want to deal with the problem, it all flows from sin. You know, I, I, we say this all the time. Hey, somebody just shot up a place and killed a bunch of innocent people. And then we focus on what they killed them with. What we need to focus on, why they want to kill everybody? You know, what's perpetuating these kind of people? And let me tell you, it's sin. And, and, and so until we, until we take that on, uh, as Bubba said, and it was a great analogy. It even made it to the Senate floor one time. If all you're doing is going after the weapons that people are killing people with, you might as well It's be like you being in a house and you've got a toilet on the second floor that's overflowing and you just keep mopping on the first floor. You never go upstairs and stop the leak. You better go to where the leak is. Uh, so, so anyway, so now heaven has become John's uh, vantage point now. Uh, the, the most of the remainder of the book of Revelation, we're going to see heaven now. We're leaving earth. We're done with the seven letters to the church, the churches that existed at that time. And now... You're going to see John. He's going to be ushered uh, in into heaven, and uh, and it's it's incredible what what he sees. So uh, let let's start um, with um, uh, with uh, verses one through eleven. Uh, John leaves dealing uh, with things of the earth and now is allowed to see heaven. Now, unlike Paul, if you remember in 2 Corinthians, if you've ever read this in chapter twelve, I believe you see that Paul. He also got to see the third heaven, but he was forbidden to talk about it. And remember, he said, the reason why that God's given me, one of the reasons I have this thorn, and I prayed three times for him to release it, is because of the vision that I was allowed to see and the miraculous things that God's doing through me. He's leaving this thorn in my flesh, whatever it is, and there's all kinds of theories, and that's all they are. If, if God wanted us to know what it was, he would have told us. 
But John says that I'm being harassed by a demon. This is so miserable, and he's using it against me, and you won't remove it. Why? To keep me from becoming conceited. Paul doesn't leave us hanging on why it happened or why God won't remove it. You know, sometimes we just don't know why. We know exactly why. Paul said, I got to deal with this because I'm too arrogant. So what God is doing is he's keeping me humble and reminding me, even though I've seen the third heaven and all these miraculous things are going on, he has to keep me humbled through suffering. So I celebrate calamity. I celebrate persecution because it makes me weak. And when I'm weak, that's when I'm actually strong because now I'm depending on Jesus. And, uh, and you see, if you ever seen all the things Paul suffered and Paul said, I'll tell you why I have to suffer. I, I, I have the potential to be arrogant. So he keeps me humble. He tells us why. You know, he, I, God keeps reminding me not to hang sin over my head, not to forget how gracious he's been. And if he never did another thing for me, what he forgave me for was enough. And, and so, but this time, John is going to be given quite a privilege. He's going to be allowed to tell us what he sees. And that's, that's Revelation chapter 4. Uh, so, uh, so that's going to be cool. It's the most complete and informative in all of Scripture. Verses four, I mean, chapter four and five. We're only going to do four today. That deal with this second vision that was given to John. The first vision was what the glorified Christ, and now here comes vision number two. He's going to see the throne, and he's going to get to go into the third heaven, and he's going to be able to tell us about it. So let's start with verse one. Uh, if, if that's not a good enough setup, I don't know how to get you fired up for what we're about to do right now. That's 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 really. Uh, so so now let's talk about verse one. After this, we're not even going any further. Now, after this means it's the beginning of a new vision. So we, we, I've, I've seen the glorified Christ. I've been given what to write down to the seven churches. And now John says, and now after that happened, here's what happened next. I get a new vision. Glorified Jesus was the first. Letters to the church are done. Now this also shifts from uh, church age, things that are. This is important if you're going to learn Revelation. It moves. We, we, he, he's been, those letters were things that were happening at the time. They certainly have much bigger meaning than that. But now he's going to shift from things that are to things that will take place. That's important that you know we're making that change. Everybody with me? Okay. So, so now this will center on the throne of God. Uh, and this is a prologue to, to future historical events. We're, we're going to start moving now to the tribulations coming, the millennial kingdom, uh, the eternal state. That's all ahead. But we're now we've decided we're, it's almost like y'all just jumped in the truck and I said, all right, next stop, tribulation. Then from there on to the millennial kingdom. Then from there we're going to the eternal state of things. But we just got in the truck today to start that journey. Okay? That may be the most Calhoun County interpretation of the revelation there has ever been. Okay, all right, so John, first of all, here's what you got you to gotta look at this. After this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open to heaven. Don't miss the exclamation point. Does your Bible have one? It's a big deal. Uh, and, and John is astonished that the door was standing open to heaven, and he indicates that with that exclamation point. That's, uh, I mean, when they were, when John wrote this down, he indicated something there that uh, when they started doing the, the these scriptures and putting them all the different language, they said, "Well, hey, we got to put something there for them to realize this was a big deal." We look at what John wrote. He couldn't believe it. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being on the island of Patmos and all of a sudden you've done these letters, you've seen the glorified Christ, you go, "Well, surely this is all I'm going to get." And all of a sudden Jesus is about to say, "Hey, come here, w- come here for what?" Behold, the door of the third heaven is standing open, and you're going in. You're going to see it. Can you imagine what that would have been like? By the way, the answer to that question is no. We can't imagine what that was going to be like. And, but, it, but we know that John was, was astonished at what he saw. Uh, and then he moves on, and, and he says this is, he sees the third heaven. Now, when I say third heaven, what, what you're, Burge, what do you mean by that? Well, the first heaven is Earth's atmosphere, Okay. The second heaven is the interplanetary uh, and interstellar space, which I need Bubba here to explain all that to you. And then above that is the third heaven where, where God resides, and that's what he is seeing. So the throne room of God where Christ ascended and where he has been seated at the right hand of God after his resurrection. What, what's one time we see in Scripture, though, where he stood up? Stephen. 
Can you imagine? You remember that? And we hit that in Acts. Don't let me go down that road today. We'll be here. I'll be, I can't go down that road. But let me tell you this. That, that is a moment. What a moment. And I have to ask us this. When he sees your life and when he sees mine, is he standing? Or does he just remain seated? Because he stood up for Stephen. Just, just, just hide that away. All right, so, so then uh, heaven now becomes John's vantage point. Can you imagine for most of the remainder of the book of Revelation? After the open door, he heard a voice. Look what he says. Uh, and the first voice that I heard speaking to me like a trumpet, underline that, said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. So he heard a voice like a trumpet, uh, and it's familiar to him because it's the same voice, if you go back, of the first vision of the glorified Jesus. Jesus orders John to come up here. John is now given permission to see heaven, and that permission comes from Jesus. The throne will be the central theme of this vision, and it's going to be mentioned 11 times, okay? And, uh, and, and, and here's what we're about to get. We're going to get description of the divine throne of glory. We're going, to, we're going to be told who's on the throne. We're going to be told what's going on around the throne, what comes from the throne, what stands before the throne, who is in the center of the throne, and what is directed toward the throne. All that's coming. Does that fire anybody up? We're going to get all that. So here is uh, in verse 2, heaven, and, and when you see this in verse 2, Listen to this. He said, at once I was in the Spirit, and that's the Holy Spirit. And behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. Now, I'm going to tell you what, what's about to go away, and I want it to go away. And, and, and I need it to go away. You need it to go away. We all need it to go away. Some of these ridiculous, trivialized visions of heaven, how we turn it into some cartoon garbage that that guys, we got we got to come off that. Okay, this is that thing in our finite minds as human beings. We keep trying to make God something we're more comfortable with, you know, and keep ourselves a little more elevated. This anything anybody's ever told you about heaven, you have no idea. Okay, it's it it, it doesn't even remotely. Okay, so too many times we've seen it be trivialized, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, even John, when I was in the Spirit that he could see the throne so clearly he had to say, Behold. He couldn't stop himself. The Holy Spirit says, All right, Jesus says, Come up here, I'm going to show you something. Holy Spirit says, I'm going to let you see it. And his first reaction is, Behold. Can you imagine? It wasn't like, Oh, well, that's interesting. Yeah, that kind of reminds me of that farm I went to one time. Or I remember one time seeing this. Uh, it's something like Queen Elizabeth sat on. Now, that's not his response. His response is, behold, the focus is on the one seated, not a piece of furniture. Okay? And, uh, and, and so when you see this, look what it says next. And, and, and he said, I, I, I behold, a throne stood in heaven. It stood. What, why, what does he mean it stood there? It means that God's sovereign. I look, and, and his rule is fixed. His throne stood there. It wasn't rickety. I wasn't sure about it. No, it stood as I could see it. And, and, and it's not a piece of furniture. This is a symbol of God's rule. And, and the focus is, is not going to be so much on the throne, but, but the one who is seated on the throne. Okay, so that, let's pay attention to that. And then we notice that he is seated and seated is a posture, we do know this, of, of a king that is reigning. He's, it's, he's not resting. He's not hanging out, you know, relaxing you know, like we do in our chairs. He's not doing that. He's, his posture that he sees is one of a king that is reigning, that is sovereign, that is in control, that is ruling. Uh, so it's not rest, it's reign, R-E-I-G-N, uh, because uh, and I'll tell you why he's sitting like this, because, you know why? Judgment's about to take place, and he's ready. And, he, and this, should, this should be something that, honestly, we have a healthy fear of. 
We should have a healthy fear of this. John does not name who is on the throne, but uh, but it's the one that Isaiah saw in uh, Isaiah 6, 1. You're going to see a lot of, the, we're going to go through some old prophets here, and when they got to see it, it sure does match up to what John is seeing. He said, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, this is Isaiah, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Do you remember Micaiah, the prophet? Uh, he says, I, this is in 1 Kings, I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by him on his left and his right. That's 1 Kings twenty two nineteen. Psalms 47, 8, God sits on his holy throne. Daniel 7, 9, 10, Ezekiel 1, 26 through 28. Am I moving through those too quick? Y'all need those again? Okay, let's do those again. So I got fired up there. 1 Kings 22, 19. This is from the Old Testament. Psalms 47, 8. And you know Daniel tracks with, with the, the revelation. Daniel 7, 9 through 10. Ezekiel 1, 26 through 28. I don't have time to read all those, but let me tell you what you'll find. I read one of them. Let me tell you what you'll find in every single one of them. Ain't nothing casual about it. They're terrified. When, when, they see, when, they, when, they, when they see God on his throne, it is not, well, that's kind of neat. They're terrified. They, 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 they can hardly take it in. There's nothing flippant about it. There's no big man upstairs about it. All these prophets, and you'll see this, two things about it every time, terrified and humble. Terrified and humble. Just, just, just see it. Think about Job. Y'all heard me reference that many times. And when Job finally got the resume, when God said, hey, who is it that questions me? And he runs his resume, and he finally, through suffering, gets so intimate with God. He sees him so clearly. He says, I despise myself, and I repent in ashes and dust. So now let's look at the, the, the description that we get. And John says, and he who sat there had an appearance of Jasper. Now, I have the English Standard Version, so I have Carnelian. Some of y'all may have uh, uh, Sardis or, or Sardius. That, that's a, it's the same exact gem. It's just that the, those of you that have Sar, uh, Sardius, uh, Sardius, that's what it was called a long time ago. ESV is a newer translation. It's the same gem, but now we call it Carnelian. Same exact thing. It's the same, same gem. Uh, it, it's better known uh, now as Carnelian, and, and it looks like it, it, it's red, and you know what it looks like? It looks like blood. It's the color of blood. It's symbolic of the righteous wrath of God. It's the color of divine anger. He says, and he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper, we'll get to that, and Carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. So, Remember, too, if you go to Exodus 28, 15, write that down, you'll see that the Jewish high priest had a carnelian on the breastplate of what he wore. Okay? So, and who's the ultimate high priest? Jesus. Okay? So, and he's sitting there uh, with this, and then uh, when, when he goes to, to look and, and continue, he also sees a jasper stone, uh, which is crystal clear like a diamond, Ezekiel says when he saw it, 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 was, it, it was like a flashing light, a blazing fire reflecting the colors of the spectrum. See, we're about to see a rainbow again, too. So, so he, he sees that. And by the way, just uh, in, in passing, a long time ago when Carnelian was called uh, Sardius, that's how the town Sardis got their name. They, they, they had that, and they took their name from that. And we, they were back on the seven letters, just a little throwback there for you. So the high priest had both the first and last stones, and, and, and there's a lot of commentary that says that what it really stood for, some said that it, it represented the firstborn, Reuben, uh, and then the lastborn, Benjamin. Uh, it depicts God's covenant relationship with Israel. His wrath will still come. We know that even on the unrepentant of Israel. We know that much of Israel will be saved, but when they're going to be saved? During the tribulation. So this is all symbolic of, of, of the, that that's coming as well. 
Uh, it also, it meaning he hasn't forgot his promise with them, but they are going to have to repent just like the Gentiles, and he's going to give them their best shot to do so. And let me just tell all of you right now, yes, people will come to Christ during the tribulation, but you don't want to adopt that plan. I'd go ahead and get that done now. You don't want to be any part of that. Okay? So uh, it also uh, means when you look at Reuben and Benjamin too, uh, the, you know, remember Benjamin was called uh, the son of my right hand, and then there's a picture of God the Son uh, sitting at the right hand of the Father. So there's a lot of symbolism going on. Now this vision uh, that, that John is seeing, that I want you to understand this, this vision at this point is not one of peace and comfort. Uh, it, it is one of, of the terror of God's judgment. And when, when John is seeing this, and think about the others who got to see it, the writer of Hebrews you know, it talks about this, uh, Deuteronomy 4.24, when they say what? Truly our God is what? A consuming fire. And, and you don't want to be on the wrong side of it. And so you see what John is, is seeing here. Uh, and, and then if you look at the last part here in 3B, and we start talking about this rainbow and what's around the throne, uh, the rainbow, and it had an emerald in its appearance, what is the rainbow? Well, we know this. It's a reminder of God's covenant. It's a reminder of God's faithfulness. It re- it's a reminder of God's mercy and grace. And this is that beautiful balance, and you can reference that in Genesis 9, 13 through 17. This is the thing you got to understand about God, and we really unpack this uh, in our series on knowing God uh, by J.I. Packer, where you can know about God and still not know God. And the point that Packer makes and Scripture makes is we, and we talked about this just the other day uh, with a group that, that we were studying the Word of God with, and all of us said the biggest problem, it was the, it was the guys that stayed with us, the pastors from, uh, from England, and they agreed. They said the biggest problem around the world is people seem to pick out one, maybe two attributes of God, and they teach that. They don't teach them all. And you've got to know all the attributes. And John is seeing right now, he sees judgment, he sees wrath, but now he's also noticing, wait a minute, but there's faithfulness, there, there's, there's steadfastness, there's grace, there's mercy. I, I'm reminding of that cov- I'm reminded of that covenant too. God's attributes always operate in perfect harmony. And brothers and sisters that may be watching and listening, don't leave any of it out. You miss it. You, you create a false god when you do that. You have to understand that his grace and mercy is so wonderful. Why? Because of his wrath, because of his judgment, that he would actually give us a gift of redemption for that wrath to never touch us when we deserve it. So it all works. But what if I've just been given this gift and nobody's ever told me about his wrath? Nobody's ever told me about his judgment. You know what I think? Eh. That's of no value. You want to know what you're being saved from, right? And see, John is seeing it on the throne. It's all right there. Everything about God is there. So, yeah, you love seeing that, that rainbow, and it's also why you see this group, who they've adopted the rainbow. They may not have consciously thought about it, but this adoption of the rainbow for a rebellion to God's standard, it, 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 it's not happenstance, okay? That's mocking his mercy. You aren't, ain't going to punish us. Nothing's going to happen to us. We'll do what we want to do. All that's in play. But anyway, so but that's another sermon. But so so the wrath uh, will never be at the expense expense of his faithfulness. Judgment doesn't override his promises. His power and holiness, without faithfulness and mercy, would cause us to live in constant terror. What if all we had was the other attributes? We didn't have. What if we didn't know about mercy? What if we didn't know about his faithfulness? What if we didn't know about grace? And all we knew was the power and the holiness, and we knew we weren't holy. You would live your whole life in constant terror. I don't know what to do. I can't tell you how many times. I just had a conversation with a guy a minute ago. He's very upset. And I said, look, those of us that are redeemed, we shouldn't be anxious. Why? Because I promise you God hadn't forgot you in this moment. You haven't been forgotten. Talked to a young man last night. Hey, I know this hurts. I know you're going through this. You think God didn't know about this? What God just removed from your life, you're not there, to, but, but, in, but, but in, in, in time, you're going to be thankful he removed this person from your life. It breaks your heart right now. But, but, but you, if you truly belong to God and you've got to look up and go, so you've taken this away from me, it must be for my own good. 
I, I've had that happen with friends of mine. We pray and pray and pray about a job. Oh, I've been out of a job. Got to find a job. This is the job. I think this is the job. And all of us get on our face, put our hands on them, pray, 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 pray. They pray. Wife prays. Everybody prays. What happened? I didn't get the job. Well, let's praise the Lord then that you didn't get that job. And then you know what happened? This person found a job. It wasn't, wasn't as soon as he hoped. Like that man, God said, don't save any up. It'll spoil. But I'll have it there in the morning. You trust me for that. You trust me, I'm going to get your job. Yes, I'd like for you to do it today. It won't be today. But do you trust it's coming? Yeah. When? Longer than you want it to be. But it's coming. That's, won't you trust me for a little while, and then I'll give it to you. And you know what? He's in the job that's, that's ten times better than the job that he thought that was just the end all. Maybe God knows what he's doing. So anyway, you see all this going on. And if we didn't know that, we would be in constant terror. All right, so now let's move into here we go. We're about to get into the 24s. And, boy, this 24 ride is going to be a wild ride. Uh, verse 4, around the throne there were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments. We already know that from the seven letters to the churches, so we're not, we're, we already know what that's about because we've already been taught that, with golden crowns on their heads. And here we go. Now the much debate about the 24. Who in the world are these 24? So 24 thr thrones, 24 elders. This has been much debated, and we're not going to debate it here. I'll throw you out some of the thoughts on it, and then, and then we'll kind of roll. Uh, we do know this. Let's, re let's take care of what we do know. These are not angels. That we know. Uh, they do not meet the criteria to be angels. Nowhere is this term elders ever used to represent angels. Um, the most likely, the most plausible that these are redeemed humans that are part of uh, the church being raptured. They represent the church. Uh, these are redeemed humans. Now, how do we know that? What did I just say? How do we know? White garments. Who did Jesus say he was going to put white garments on? The redeemed. He told us that, right, in the seven letters. So, so that's good. Uh, and we know that he promised these to the redeemed. Crowns, we know about that. The crowns on their head, more evidence that they are not angels because angels don't get any crowns. Uh, these are crowns promised by Christ for various, what, reasons for the ones who, at the end of every letter, overcome. Those who overcome that do not, you know, you, you, you might have been martyred and you wouldn't give in. You, you might have uh, had impact. You might have been someone who uh, produced a lot of disciples. But why is there 24? Now, I will tell you this. We do know that that number is one of the numbers that God loves and uses for completion and representation. Now, how do we know that? First Chronicles 24, write down these verses. This is your Bible study after this today. 4 and 5, and then also 7 and 18. So First Chronicles 24, verses 4 and 5, also 7 and 18. There were 24 officers of the sanctuary, and that represents the 24 courses uh, of the Levitical priest. David put this together, 24 heads of the priestly families. These are 24 heads he made representative of the whole priesthood, also 24 divisions of, uh, uh, that, that also is part uh, of those who take care in, uh, in uh, the, uh, the, the temple. You find that in 1 Chronicles 25. So David was told by God to establish this 24. So when you see these 24 there, that's not just happenstance. That's, that's once again God fulfilling prophecy. And now when you have the throne room and you have these, these people around him, they represent the new priesthood with the high priest. And this is everything, uh, the priesthood in its fullness. And they represent the whole priesthood and they represent that this is going to be the new temple. Now, some things that, uh, that the disagreements on this, and there's a few. Some people are very much in the camp that 12 of them are from what we call the Old Testament, and they represent the 12 tribes of Israel, and then the other 12 are from the New Testament, and that's 12 apostles. That's the 12 and the 12. Some people think that. Most believe that, the other, that, that believe more than that, that these 24 are just one group. They're just 24 that represent the raptured, the glorified, the coronated church who, uh, who, who, who we know will see uh, and, and they will sing the song of redemption. And we're going to see that coming up. And they'll sing that uh, with, of course, 
uh, Jesus, and we know that they represent the church, will judge alongside Jesus. Some think that. So whether you're a 12 tribes of Israel, 12 apostles, certainly fine, uh, or you could just be it's 24 redeemed people representing the whole church. Either way, that's uh, that's the two thoughts that kind of get out ahead of the Some of them are a little ridiculous. So that's the that's the two that hold the most um, uh, hold the most water. Now let's look about what he sees coming from the throne, and this is this is going to be very intimidating. From the throne, uh, verse five. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire which are, he explains that, we don't have to wonder on that one, are the seven spirits of God, which we've already covered. Okay, we've already covered that. And before the throne, there was as if there were a sea of glass like crystal. Uh, so let's, let's do 5B through 6A there. So seven torches, not lamps. They're lamps in the beginning, first time we see them. Now they're torches. That means it's on fire. It's burning. They're not lamps. This is, as we know, these seven represents the completion, the, the perfect number of God, and this is the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Seven spirits, as we discussed in chapter 1. Now, the sea of glass that we see is a sea metaphor. It, it's not a sea in heaven because we're told later that the sea is no more. But it's a metaphor for the sea because the sea in its fallen state right now, and by the way, God's people... They did. They they were terrified of the sea, terrified of it, uh, and and they and they looked at the sea as representing doom, gloom, and death. Which is why you hear that in the new Jerusalem and the new heaven and the new earth, the sea will be no more. What that means is it's not going to have that terrifying uh, look that it does now in its fallen state. I share. I look at the sea many times. It can be beautiful, but also can be quite terrifying. If it's ever out of control, it ain't no fun to be around it. So anyway, um, he is seeing a vast pavement of glass shining at the base of the throne like sparkling crystal, and, and, and this is quite the scene. The reason why he's being shown this is it's transparent and it's clean. It is not rough and rowdy like the sea looks now, and this represents a steadiness unlike the fallen sea that we see now. It's a calmness. It's, it's not even moving. It's perfectly still. And so this is reassurance once again that God is in control. Heaven is quite the scene. Uh, so then in and around the throne, let's look what happens next. And, uh, and it's about to really get wild now. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in the front and behind. Now, uh, when we get to these living creatures, we'll just roll on, look at seven. The first living creature is a lion, the second living creature like an ox, uh, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. So keep in mind, it's like a lion, it's like an ox, but when he gets to the one that has man, he says the third living creature with the face of a man. He didn't say like a man uh, there, but then you look and says the fourth living creature like an eagle, in flight, and the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Praise his holy name. So the four living creatures, they play a very significant role in the events that are to come. They, I mean, they, we, we're going we're gonna to spend some time with them going forward, okay? So they, they're in the inner circle. Uh, they are in constant motion around the throne. They are not animals, so, so don't make them out to be animals. Uh, Ezekiel, uh, in chapter 1, verses 12 and 17, and we're going to read some of this coming up. That's two verses to look at. But now, if you have your Bible, turn over to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 1, I'm going to start in verse 4. He really struggles to make sense of them. He, he sees them, uh, and, and look what he says about these four creatures, because he got to look at them himself. As I look, behold, a stormy wind came from out of the north, and a great cloud with brightness around it, and fire flashing forth continually in the midst of the fire as, it, as if it were gleaming metal. And from the midst it came the likeness, underline that, of four living creatures. 
And this was their appearance. They had a human likeness, but each had four faces, and each of them had four wings. Their legs were straight, and the soles of their feet were like the soles of a calf's foot, and they sparkled like burnished bronze. Under their wings on their four sides they had human hands, and the four had their faces and their wings thus. Their wings touched one another. Each one of them went straight forward without turning as they went. As for their likeness of their faces, each had a human face. The four had the face of a lion on the right side. The four had the face of an ox on the left side. And the four, the four had a face of an eagle. Such were their faces. And their wings spread out above. Each creature had two wings, each of which touched the wing of another, while two covered their bodies. Each went straight forward. Whenever the spirit would go, they went without turning as they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearances were like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches moving to and fro among the living creatures. And the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning, and the living creatures darted to and fro like the appearance of a flash of lightning. Now as I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the earth beside the living creatures, one for each of the four of them. And, and as for the appearance of the wheels and their construction, their appearance was like the gleaming of barrel, a burl, and the four had the same likeness in their appearance and construction between as if they were a wheel within a wheel. And when they went, they went in any of their four directions without turning as they went. And their rims were tall and awesome, and the rims of all four were full of eyes all around. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went beside them. And when the living creatures rose from the earth, the wheels rose Wherever the Spirit wanted them to go, they went, and the wheels rose along with them, for the Spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. When those went, these went, and when those stood, these stood. When those rose from the earth, the wheels rose along with them, for the Spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. Over the heads of the living creatures there was a likeness of an expanse, shining like all-inspiring crystal, spread out above their heads, and under the expanse their wings were stretched out, straight one toward another, and each creature had two wings covering his body. And when they went, I heard the sound of their wings like the sound of many waters, like the sound of the Almighty, a sound like the sound of an army. When they stood still, they let down their wings, and there came a voice from above the expanse over their heads. When they stood still, they let down their wings. Wow. So you hear Ezekiel, he does, he's struggling to describe to us what he's seeing. What we do know is that uh, the, 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 they're like divine war machines ready to unleash what? Judgment. Ezekiel 10, 15 says they are four living creatures. John struggles to describe them as well. Uh, now, he does say they're full of eyes, front and back. What does this mean? It means they're aware. They're alert. They're, they're comprehensible knowledge. Uh, they're not omniscient, but there's nothing that can get past them. You're not going to get by them. Okay? John says one was like a lion, one was like a calf, one's face was like a man or was a man, and one like an eagle. So the lion, many think, represents wild creatures and strength. The calf, domestic animals and service. The eagle, a flying creature, speed. And then the face of a man is the pinnacle of all creation, and it represents their ability to reason. So all of creation is represented in these four war machines, and they're standing by. I love when Ezekiel says, whatever the Spirit told them to do, they did. And they're in constant motion. Uh, he's even say he got on some wheel thing. like They got wheels, who knows? Uh, but war machines uh, would probably be the best way to describe them, representing all of God's creation. Uh, and, and, and John says, and maybe it's correct on, on Ezekiel, or maybe Ezekiel just couldn't tell. He says, I, I see six wings, four creatures, and they will play a major role in the coming judgment. And these wings, they, they denote supreme responsibility and privilege to constantly worship God. Don't miss what they're doing. They're constantly worshiping, and these wings are going toward the throne uh, and then uh, 8b through 11, and, and when you think about what's happening here, and, and the four creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around within them, within and day and night, they never cease to say, holy, 
Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who is, who was, and is, and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, worship, worship, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And that this, this you've heard, but here it is in Scripture. And all these crowns they've been given by Jesus, what do they do? They cast their crowns before the throne. He's our gift. He's our gift. He's the only one worthy. And they sing this, Worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and your will they existed and were created. And by your will they existed and were created. So the vision accumulates... The culmination is worship toward God and his throne. Here, and you're going to see it again in five when we do this, it are five great hymns of praise. The choir, as we move forward, and this is going to really, you see it happening already, the choir constantly increases. It started out with the four creatures, and then what happened? Then the elders join in. And as we go forward, you're going to see it just gets bigger and it just gets bigger, and it gets bigger. We started what? We started with a quartet. Then we jumped to 24 elders, four creatures focus on the holiness that never ceases. You remember Isaiah 6? It's getting me chills to even talk about Isaiah 6. He noted the threefold repetition, holy, holy, holy. This time he shows that he is holy through what? And we don't like it. Judgment. He is holy, and he must judge the world. Do y'all understand that? We had to be redeemed because we're not holy, and we cannot enter into the presence of the triune God without the Son. He makes us fully righteous. He, he is the, God is the only one ever called holy, holy, Holy. I'm going to reference Adrian Rogers a lot because he deserves to be referenced a lot. What a powerful man of God who is in this scene. He, he's there with Jesus waiting on all this to be done, and he definitely got a well-done, good and faithful servant. I love when he said when those of us who try to trivialize heaven and we try to pretend like it's some hunting trip we went on or it's some place we saw in a fallen creation – or we can't imagine heaven without football and hunting and fishing or even, even you know, the family reunion or, or something that we enjoy or, or some song we thought was so awesome. And he said, and this is so ridiculous, he said, I have a, I have a notion. It wouldn't surprise me in the least for those of you that think you're going to do a Q&A with the great I am. I, I would not be surprised if we spent 1,000 years on our face, saying nothing but holy, 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 when we see him. It ain't going to be a Q&A. We bring nothing to the table. And you see them preparing us for this. And why is he holy? Because he hates sin. And he hates it so much that he will pour out his wrath on it. And you know what? When you think about Jesus in the garden and those capillaries bursting, which is, from what I've gathered from many medical doctors, a level of stress that can be achieved. Blood mixed with the sweat. So much stress. And, and Jesus does not find himself that 100% man side of him. He doesn't find himself in this position over the fear of the brutality of the cross. No doubt that's nothing to look forward to. But I will go as far as to say, and I've said it in here before, but some of you are new, we have Christians who have been martyred in even worse ways. Skinned alive. Skinned alive. Can you imagine that? Surgery done on them where they remove organs one by one and slowly they kill you by taking your intestines out and they just mutilate you burned alive 
We talked about that even in our in our studies. It wasn't that. That's it's brutal, no doubt. And as as we've said in here correctly, when you see the cross and the brutality of the cross, it is a time to say, "Thank you, Jesus." For, for and, and thank you, God, for loving me, and thank you, Jesus, for fulfilling the will of your Father. And that's perfectly fine, and we should do that. But never miss, you're also looking at how much God hates sin. Because sin always matters, and he hates it. Because he's holy, holy, holy. What Jesus is, 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 is sweat and blood mixing over what he said, Father, let this cup pass. The cup, as Isaiah and the other prophets told us, is the cup of God's wrath. His wrath has been poured out on his son. And that's what Jesus is stressing over. The, the, the wrath of a holy, holy, holy father is going to be poured out on me. And Father, as as 100% human, is there another way? And keep in mind, all of his best friends won't even pray with him without falling asleep. And he still said, trust me, we have not presented ourselves of being someone and people easy to suffer over. It's one thing, as Jesus said, to take the wrath of God for somebody you love. It's quite another to take the wrath of God for people who are hard to love or that don't love you. But what did he say? When he heard no alternate plan, your will be done. And then he was resolute to the cross. But what you see here, now that the son has returned to his proper place, we'll see that wrath has been fulfilled on his son, and it was poured out on his son. He did not withhold his wrath. He poured it out on Jesus. A holy God cannot withhold his wrath. But then there's people that refuse to be redeemed. Then there's those that refuse to repent, those who have not been made fully righteous by the wrath of God being poured out on the son. They're not under his authority. He's not their Lord. Well, if they don't repent and take the gift of redemption, then God's wrath still has to pour out on them. Because God's going to rid this place of sin once and for all. For the redeemed, that's been done for you. But for the unredeemed, you still face God's wrath. You have to. So don't. Go ahead and, and repent and leave faith in self and put your faith in the one that took the wrath for you so that God's wrath never touches you because of Jesus. He's already taken it. So now, this power that, jo that John sees requires worship. The creatures refer to him as almighty. He called himself that to who? All the way back to Abraham. These creatures are still singing what God told Abraham, I'm the almighty. And the creatures say, you're almighty. You're holy. These are the things that have always been about him. Nothing's changed. And he continues to be worthy of that worship. If you have ever been in the presence of God, then you worshiped him. If you've never experienced worship, then you've never been in the presence of God. Because his presence, it pulls worship out of you. And I promise you that. Next, his eternity was what they talk about. He lives forever and ever. He transcends, transcends time. There's no beginning and no end. I cannot stand when people think they come up with some ridiculous comment. Well, who created God? Well, did you not hear what it says? He is timeless. He is the beginning. There had to be a beginning. Yeah, him. Creation flow. He's outside of time. It is an answer to time. He said, I am the beginning. I am the end. I have always been. 
And then when you get to verse 9, and all this triggers the 24 elders, and they fall down before him, they now cast their crowns before the throne. Their own excellence, holiness, honor, or reward, what? Just like Job. They pale compared to him. I mean, you realize how silly that it feels? It would be like, I know how men love sports analogies, you thinking that you were like really good at basketball and somehow you walked in the presence of Michael Jordan. You just throw the ball down. I'm not going to play in front of him. I mean, this is ridiculous. So they're sitting there going, we have crowns. We're in white garments. We've been elevated. We're heroes of the faith. And then all of a sudden they look and they, they see these creatures worshiping God on his throne, and they're like, we got to be kidding ourselves. Compared to him, we're nothing. He deserves worship. There's not a man or woman of God alive that deserves worship. Only God deserves it. And we mess up when we start worshiping these people that God has sent to, to reach and disciple us. You can be friends with them. You can appreciate them. You can be thankful for them. And I am. I am. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be teaching this Bible study without them. I'm thankful for every one of them. But I don't worship them. And they don't need to be worshipped. And, and if they desire to be worshipped, then I'd watch them. Okay? You know what they say? And this, is, this, this sums it up, and we'll end right here. Only he is worthy. And John sees it. Only he is worthy. How dare us dumb down heaven? How dare us make, try to make God more palatable, palatable for us? How dare us? He's not going to change. Now, what we need to do instead of trying to continue to make him or heaven something we're more comfortable with, we need to repent and rid ourselves of all that garbage so he can make us something he's more comfortable with. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for today. This is just, wow. I mean, this, this is mind-blowing, as it should be. It's awful difficult to put you into a box. I know, Lord, that right now in our finite state, there's only so much of this we can understand. Thank you for inspiring John to try to help us. But, Lord, I know this. One thing we've learned today, if we didn't understand anything else, is that you share your glory with no one. You made that clear. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be part of anything that you're doing. It is an honor to be obedient to you. It is an honor to be given the responsibility to be your disciples and go and make disciples. It is an honor to point people to you. And also, Lord, we love you so much. And we were reminded again today that you will not allow sin to remain on this planet. You will resolve it. And, Lord, may we find ourselves with you and standing with you against all who oppose you. I know you don't need us to defend you, but you said clearly that if we do defend you, that we will be acknowledged before you by your Son. If we choose not to defend you publicly, then the Son tells us in Matthew 10 that he will not acknowledge us before you. May we have a boldness that doesn't come from our arrogance, it doesn't come from our gifts, but a boldness that we belong to you. And we have pity on all those who oppose you. May they repent before it's too late. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for your time today.